welcome Jeff Himmelman. Thank you. Thank you all for coming so much. Um, just get situated here, make sure I don't run long. Um, first, thanks Jessica so much for the introduction and for having me here tonight at Just Strand Books. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, such an honor to be here, so thank you for having me. Um, let me try to do this in a natural way. How's that? Can you hear me okay if I just talk like this? Right. Great. So, um, to start off tonight, for those of you who are uh, new to me, new to the book, I feel like I know most of you sitting out there. Uh, I wanted to start by making a reference that New Yorkers might appreciate, which comes from this morning's New York Times. Uh, for those of you who read the New York Times, I assume that's most of you. Uh, you may have seen a piece about me in the Sunday Styles a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that, that piece was not my favorite piece. Uh, and it definitely didn't cast me in the most wonderful light. Uh, and I've wondered about that and how that happened. Uh, I know some of the answers, but in this morning's New York Times, I found what I thought was an interesting answer. It was a piece about Tony Blair and his fall from grace from the Labor Party and now his kind of resurrection during the Murdoch inquiry. Uh, and the, the piece, his final paragraph is this. He offered a mellow warning to politicians who have yet to experience their own Waterloo. You begin when you're least capable and most popular, Mr. Blair said, and you end when you're least popular and most capable. I kind of feel like that's what happened to me. Uh, when I started working on this book, I was very popular both uh, with everybody who's in it and with all the people I relied upon for information. And then the more I learned and the tougher the questions became, the less popular I became. Uh, and that is a lesson that uh, occurred throughout Ben Bradley's life. So let me tell you a little bit about how the book came to be. And then I want to introduce you to Ben through the book. How many people have read any of the book, just to, out of curiosity? A uh, fair number. So some of this will be old news to you. But for those people who don't really know who Ben Bradley is, Ben was the executive editor of the Washington Post for 23 years. He was at the paper from 1948 to 1951 and then returned in 1965 and basically took over the paper from there. So he was the, the executive editor during all of the major journalistic triumphs of the 70s that made the Post the sort of national brand that it became for a time. Um, the way I got to know Ben was that, as Jessica mentioned, I work for Bob Woodward, as most of you know. Um, and in 2007, Bob introduced me to Ben. And at the, I had met Ben once before, and he is this incredibly charismatic dude. I mean, you meet him, and you just kind of are overwhelmed by his sort of personal charisma. But more importantly, um, he was going to write another book. That was the idea, and he gave me access to his archives. And so box by box, these things would come in, and they were letters, they were memos, they were old interviews, they were old magazine pieces, uh, private notes he'd written to himself, notes other people had written to him. And so very early on, I started to kind of piece together an image of who this guy sitting in the next office over was, who very rarely spoke to me. So the way that I got to know him was through letters, and I thought I would read a few of them for you just so you could get a, a sense. For those of you who haven't looked in the book, kind of what been his life. The first letter that I quote in the book um, came in 1977 to Kay Graham. And so for those of you who don't know who she is, she was the owner of the Washington Post uh, for all of Ben's time uh, as editor. And she was the publisher for, for the first 10, 12 years. Um, and so in 1977, a guy wrote her and said that her father and her husband, who had formerly been the publisher of the Post, must be turning over in their graves because of the way she was dragging down what used to be a wonderful newspaper. And he said that he thought it was Ben's fault and the fault of another person, and then concluded by saying, I hope the day is not far off when you fire those two peckerwoods. So this was Ben's response in full. Dear Mr. Dotteridge, your letter to Mrs. Graham reminded me of the story about W.C. Fields sitting with a drink in his hand in his garden one afternoon. His secretary interrupted him repeatedly to tell him that a strange man wanted to see him and refused to say what he wanted to see him about. Finally, Fields told his secretary to give the man, quote, an equivocal answer. Tell him to go fuck himself. Sincerely, Benjamin C. Red. <laughs> and so, as I'm going through the boxes, I'm uncovering these things. And so, in the, in, the per, in, the, in the process of compiling a book like this, I, I then have to get permission from the person who wrote that letter to include it in my book. Otherwise, I can't use their name. So, Mr. Dotteridge, who got this letter from Ben telling him to fuck off, had written this letter calling Ben a peckerwood. And so, I tracked down his daughter in Colorado. Debbie Heck is her name. Um, and I called her on the phone. I finally reached her and I said, you know, your book starts, your letter starts, your dad's letter starts my book. And if you don't give me permission, I can't use it. And she said, well, what does it say? And I said, well, it calls Ben a peckerwood and Ben tells him to fuck off. And there's this pause and she goes, 
that's dad. <laughs> so part of that permission process was fun. Part of it, part of it was not fun. Um, but it's obviously not all fun in games. So one of my very favorite of the letters is another one I came across very early, and it took me a little while to really understand what it meant. But in 1985, um, the publisher of a, of a newspaper in Pueblo, Colorado, was at a panel that Ben had been on with Don Hewitt, who was the guy who founded 60 Minutes. And the, the purpose of the panel had been to talk about whether the press is arrogant. And Ben basically doesn't take that kind of job and said, maybe we are, maybe we aren't. Who cares? Who are you to call us arrogant? So this guy wrote him this very, very sanctimonious letter talking about how he had revealed his arrogance and then he signed it cordially and sincerely. He's a joker. I didn't ask him for permission. So this was Ben's response to him in full after having been called arrogant to the publisher. Editors do run the risk of appearing arrogant if they choose to disagree with anybody who calls them arrogant. You sound like one of those publishers who aims to please his pals in the community and give them what they want. No one will call you arrogant that way. No one will call you newspaper man, either. Cordially and sincerely, Benjamin Sierra. In other words, fuck off, but with much nicer language. Um, and that's the, that's the thing. So when you first meet Ben, and anybody who meets him, like he, he, was, he was in retirement when I got to know him. So he was on the seventh floor of the Post, the newsroom was on the fifth floor. And he would leave his door open, and people would like come out of their offices just to hear what he would say next, because he has a very colorful way of speaking. And the most famous of the stories about this, and then I'll move on, to some other areas of his life is when he retired, there was this big roast in the newsroom. And one of the style reporters told a story about um, a day that Ben's secretary came over to him. And she was very nervous. And she said, I have a usage question for you, a grammar question. He said, what is it? And he knew that she had been trying to transcribe one of Ben's letters. And she said, is dickhead one word or two? <laughs> <laughs> So I could tell those stories all night, but that gives you kind of a sense of who he is. And he's like that to this day. He's nine years old and, and doesn't uh, limit the way he speaks for anybody or any audience. Um, but so as you can imagine, I, I started to piece together kind of a picture of who this person was relatively quickly. And with Ben, his life was such that kind of what you see with him is what you get. So those letters, that is who he is. It wasn't like those were sort of divergent things that I had to somehow figure out some way to present in a harmonious way. It was, he was always that way. And so what I really tried to do with this book is take some of those sort of magnetic qualities for granted and try to figure out what were the qualities that made him one of the most successful editors of all time. What, what turned somebody into that? Um, and Ben was born with a lot of advantages. He was born into wealth. Um, he was the 52nd member of his family, or 51st, depending on to go to Harvard. Uh, so it's, he was in some ways born on third base, uh, but if he was born on third base, he stole home in a cloud of dust and really, really got there. Um, and so when I tried to isolate the qualities in him that I thought described who he was, I had to start with a kind of magnetism. And the way that it comes across in the letters, there was a, a, a study at Harvard called the Grant Study. I don't know if anybody out there is familiar with it, but it tracks these Harvard kids from classes of 1938 to 1941 uh, over, the track, over the course of their whole lives. And, and Ben, for his memoir, requisitioned all of his surveys. So I had surveys of his every two years giving honest answers to questions he would never have let me ask him. Um, but one of the most interesting documents in there is an interview that the head of the study, the guy who had become the head of the study, did with Ben in 1969. And ben had just become the executive editor of the paper. And over the course of this 18-page report, the guy just gets sucked in, in the same way that I did, in the same way that my wife did, in the same way that everybody does who meets Ben. And by the end of the report, this is the final paragraph of his report. He writes, this was a man of Ben. This was a man with a great capacity to focus his attention. He was a man who cared about things only as they related to people. What he admired, oh, uh, sorry, unless he gave up golf when he stopped playing it with Jack Kennedy, which I'll get into in a moment. What he admired most about the latter was Kennedy's ability to love and his gracefulness. I left the interview feeling that I had greater capacity as a human being just from having known him. And then the psychiatrist wrote in by hand, after he finished his typewritten report, he wrote in, an illusion, yes, but what in a personality creates that illusion in others? So if you want to know how Ben did his job, that's nine-tenths of it, is that it really wasn't an illusion. A lot of what he did at the Washington Post was figure out a way to make people feel good about what they were doing. And it sounds like a really simple thing, but it was, some, it was a very much a part of his permanent practice. And so when he came to the Post, uh, 
1965, the Post was a small newspaper. He describes it as a sleepy newspaper. Um, they had been doing some good work in the 40s and 50s, but they had kind of been posting. K. Graham's husband had been checking out. He was mentally ill. Um, and when he died and she took over, they kind of didn't know what they were doing. And they brought Ben in to kind of write the ship. Um, and so very shortly after he got there, he wrote, uh, he wrote a memo that kind of defines what he was trying to do from the moment he arrived. Um, and it was in the context of talking to a foreign correspondent. So these guys had been used to just kind of being able to write whatever the hell they wanted. Um, and Ben was always supportive of people's ability to write whatever they wanted, but he had an agenda. And so this is what he wrote to this reporter, and this really characterizes his early years of the paper about as well as anything could. We are not trying to make this paper flatter, he wrote. We are trying to make it fairer. What you interpret as an effort to remove flavor, individuality, and delusion is in fact an effort to remove the tipped hand, the veiled stand, the editorial phrases that make your position clear while they cloud the news. If we flattened your vivid writing to colorless mush, the Washington Post would be a loser. We want flair, audacity, and a flashing quality to wax in this paper. You've got those qualities. They're valued. But we're talking here about something entirely different. Tilt. Tilt flaws the effort we're making to become a newspaper distinguished by flavor, individuality, and delusion, while being above all fair. So that's what he set out to do when he got there. And so for the first five or six years, he made a series of improvements at the Post. But the first really defining moment for him and for the newspaper, and the moment that both he and Kate Graham would later say paved the way for Watergate, which is obviously something you're looking into when you think about someone like Ben Bradley. What makes Watergate possible? How does someone do that? Um, it really starts for the Post with the Pentagon Papers. And I don't know how many of you, what you know about the Pentagon Papers, so just very quickly. Um, they were a top secret study that had been commissioned uh, really during the Johnson administration. Uh, and they were delivered right, right after, uh, right before Nixon came into office. So they actually didn't have anything to say about Nixon, which nobody really realizes because it's Nixon who went so bad shit after they came out. Um, and they didn't contain incredibly scandalous revelations about what had been going on in Vietnam. A lot of the stuff had been reported before. Uh, but it confirmed everything in a way that really drove home the point that the government wasn't telling people the truth. And so the Times got the documents first. Daniel Ellsberg, who was an analyst, the Rand Corporation linked them to the Times. Um, and so the Times ran a couple of stories. They were huge exclusives. I mean, they, they, had, they rented a hotel suite and stationed private guards at the door to, to, to guard the papers and to guard the reporters while they wrote the stories. They took it that seriously. Um, the stories come out. Nixon goes crazy. The, the government in, enjoins the New York Times that so says, you can no longer print these stories. And so into the breach steps Ben and the Washington Post. And it was a very different legal question for them. The Times had already been enjoined. So Ellsberg leaked the papers next to the Post, and the Post had to decide, are we going to do this or not? Um, and both for Kay and for Ben, that was kind of the moment where they had to make an up or down decision. So literally, they have all the papers, all the reporters are at Ben's house. They didn't want to work in the newsroom either because they were afraid that people would find out they had the papers. So they're working out at Ben's library, dining room, kitchen. Um, late in the day, uh, Ben calls Kay at her house, and the lawyers make their pitch. And then Ben got on and made his pitch. Um, and there's this moment where she kind of gulps. And she says, let's go. Let's do it. And that was in June of 1971. And though they only ran a couple of stories before they got enjoined, um, it brought the Supreme Court into the mix. And it put the Post and the Times into the same sentence. And that was what Ben's goal had been from the moment he walked into the newsroom. And in a lot of ways, that was the moment that defined the modern Washington Post. And Ben will tell you that, Kay will tell you that, everybody will tell you that. It was kind of the moment where they realized, we're kind of in it to win it, and as, <laughs> as Randy might say, um, sorry, that's an American Idol joke, but missed that one. Um, <laughs> or you've got to have it, I don't know, what's the new tag, what's the new tag phrase? Um, anyway, that was the moment where they kind of realized that they were that they wanted to scale the heights. And, and it, is a, it is a moment that you can look back on now and wonder where the analog is. Like, who's making that decision now? And it's kind of hard to find. I mean, it was, it was a privately held company. They were about to go public. That was one of the reasons that it was a perilous decision for the paper. They had literally, their, their public stock had been issued that week. And so Kay was literally betting her company on journalism and on high quality, high level, stick it to the government journalism. Um, and I guess that still exists. I think it's just harder and harder to find. But that was really the moment when they figured out kind of who were they, they were going to be uh, and what they were going to do. So 
the other small thing to get into before I get into Watergate that I'll just touch on quickly is one of the ironies of the fact that it was the Sunday style section that um, attacked me, as I would put it, um, is that contrary to what you might know about Ben, uh, the whole concept of the style section was Ben's idea. Uh, the Washington Post was the first newspaper to have a style section, called the style section. It was the first paper to have a discrete section dedicated purely to lifestyle, people, women, what happened in the town, the life of the town. Um, ben started that almost as soon as he got to the, to the executive editorship in 1968. In January of 1969, it ran. And it was a huge departure for people in Washington. Like, Kay Graham loved the Foreign About Women section, which was his predecessor. And it was about generals' wives and all this stuff that she thought was great, you know, teas and parties, and garden parties. And Ben made it this sort of hard-hitting section. It's where his wife Sally Quinn came to write. It was where all these famous Post reporters came to write. And in many ways, the modern Post, including the Post of Watergate, isn't possible without that decision either. But it's a decision that gets a lot less attention in Ben's CV. People always say Pentagon paper is Watergate. But I think when, when anybody reads a modern newspaper now, I think it's almost more difficult to imagine without a style section than it is without some of the harder news components. Uh, so it's an overlooked piece of his biography, which I go into in some depth in the book, and it's an interesting piece of it. Um, but so to get to Watergate, there are uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to say about that. Uh, I don't know how many of you read the uh, excerpt of my book that was in New York Magazine, uh, but it definitely caused a fear down in Washington. Um, and I've had to defend it um, any number of times. And there, there are two main things that I found in the book that have... have gotten all the airtime, essentially, in the discussion of my book. And so the first is I came across in an old interview that Ben had done in 1990 for his memoir, a moment where they're talking with his interlocutor, and he's talking about the sort of Hollywood version of Watergate that we've all come to know so well, uh, Deep Throat in the garage and all of this. And he talked about it at some length, and then he said at the end, you know, you can't really hold me to the Hollywood version of this. Uh, and the, the quote that stuck in my mind and caused me to ask further questions was, he said, there's a residual fear in my soul that that isn't quite straight. And Ben is not the kind of person who has a residual fear in his soul about much. And so I thought that was interesting. And I brought it to Ben, and we talked about it further. Um, and then I brought it to Bob Woodward, my former boss. Uh, we had a very long and interesting, and I thought very appropriate interview about the topic. And then uh, a couple of days later, I was sort of summoned to Ben's house, and uh, I had been, it's, I guess, too, too difficult to explain, but to make the long story short, uh, Bob was very unhappy that I had found this document and that I had brought it to him and that I might even consider including it in my book. Uh, and we had a meeting, which I describe in the book, and which is also in the New York excerpt, um, in which I realized, as soon as it had happened, and Kirsten can attest to this, that it was kind of a founding moment for me and for this enterprise. Uh, either this book was going to be the genuine engagement of what I found, dirtiness, difficulty, and all, or it was going to be the kind of sanitized puff piece that I think everybody expected when I started to write the book. And it was really that moment when I realized that reporters really like to report about other people. Um, they don't really like it when you turn the lens on them. Um, the second piece that I discovered in the Watergate stuff is the far more interesting piece to me, and it has gotten very little attention, and I think in time that's going to change. But the more interesting piece of this is that in December of 1972, after Nixon had been reelected, the Post's really seminal Watergate reporting occurred in September and October of 1972. That's where the paper really made its name. That's why they won the Pulitzer. But after Nixon was reelected, uh, the story of the trail went cold. Nixon had won, everybody figured this was just political hijinks, who cares? And the Post was having a really tough time. And in that moment, after a couple of weeks of really struggling, Ben authorized his reporters to contact the grand jurors in the Watergate criminal case. And this was a legally gray area. So there is no law that says you cannot contact grand jurors. Grand jurors violating their oaths is a contemptuous offense. But for you to contact the grand jury, there's no law that says you can't. And so Ben kind of got a fudgy answer from the lawyers, and they, they let Bob and Carl do it. Uh, and so in their book, elsewhere over the last 40 years, they said, we tried to reach the grand jurors. Uh, we knocked on a few doors. We got nothing. It was a failed enterprise. We all feel really bad about it. 
and we move on. And so one day in early 2011, I was sitting at a table going through the Watergate section for the 40th time, trying to figure out what the hell I was going to say about it. And I was going back through all of the memos to try to piece everything together. And I came across a memo that from the first page was clearly, beyond doubt, a transcript of an interview with the grand jury that Carl Bernstein had written on his typewriter. And it was a it was a holy shit moment, as they say. Kirsten, I think, heard me screaming very far away. Um, and it was, it, it was, if there was, if the, the deep throat moment was one, this was the other. Uh, and it was a moment where I realized that when you start to tug on established myths, they don't always add up the way they're supposed to. And the grand juror piece is a really, really interesting piece of this story. They penetrated the grand jury. Judge Sirica, who was the judge in the case, became aware that they had tried to contact grand jurors, called them in, read them the riot act, and let them go. But he wrote later in his memoir, had he known, had they gotten any information from a grand jury, he would have thrown them in jail. And so for 40 years, they kind of skated away from all of this with kind of no harm, no foul as their logic, and so did Ben. Uh, and it wasn't true. And those two experiences, I guess, made me realize, and what I tried to impart in the book was that these were human beings, these were real people, these were people who didn't make perfect decisions. And we get this kind of sanitized version of the Watergate story, but it's really not that clean. And the kind of, we think the forces of right were on one side and the forces of wrong were arrayed on the other and there was this mortal clash and right won. Um, and I guess in the broadest contour, that's true, uh, but maybe not in the more minute contours. Um, and so th those revelations have gotten a lot of the attention um, in my book, and I think unduly so. I think uh, there's a lot more that tells you a lot more about who Ben is than that. That was reporters and editors in a desperate moment kind of being desperate. That shows you that they were human, but it doesn't say that much about the actual trajectory of Watergate. And the, the person who I thought revealed this the best to me um, was a guy named Harry Rosenfeld. He was the Metro editor during Watergate, so he directly oversaw Carl and Bob during all of their reporting. And his words might as well be mine, that's why I put them in the book wholesale, but I, I think he sums up Watergate better than anybody could. He told me this last September. He wrote, we can talk about this endlessly, but the sun sets. Watergate was a piece of gold. It told the truth. If it wasn't right in every last detail, it was right in more detail than any story I have ever dealt with, certainly with that kind of tenure. It was brass solid. And you can argue about this and you can argue about that, but the truth is, great wrongdoing was revealed at great odds that shook up the country and affects it to this day. The paradigm was set by our Watergate investigation. Everybody earned his stripes, everybody. The fact that they weren't perfect human beings, the fact that they didn't make perfect judgments every time, I don't think it says that. The one other small Watergate moment before I move on to one other element is my favorite quote probably of Ben's in this entire thing came when the April of the following year, everybody's resigning, the Post wins the Pulitzer Prize for its reporting the previous year, and Carl and Bob went into Ben's office to, to yell at him for having agitated for the Post to receive the Pulitzer and not them personally. They were very put out that they had won personally. And they gave this long, drawn-out argument and then Ben asked to summarize what he told them in response said, I told them that if it weren't for the guts of the Grams, they'd be pumping gas in the place. <laughs> and that's why the Post won, and not them. I always thought that was a very good summation of Ben's philosophy on a lot of different things. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, and then I'm happy to take questions, um, is I want to talk for a minute about Janet Cook, just because I think that uh, probably, mo how many of you out there who haven't read the book or whatever know who Janet Cook is or what Janet Cook was? Right, so not very many of you. Um, so, for those of you who haven't gotten that far in the book, or uh, I don't remember, um, Janet Cook, in, in a lot of ways, tells you more about Ben than Watergate does. Um, the quick story on Janet Cook is, in 1980, a young reporter, a young black reporter, came to the Post, and I traced the whole sort of, the racial politics of the Post were always very all complicated. Um, and she was a product of a lot of struggle that had gone on at the paper. Um, they had been sued by seven black employees during right, uh, three months before Watergate. They got sued um, for employment uh, discrimination practices. It was an ongoing process for them. And when Janet Cook 
when Janet Cook came to the paper in 1980, she was, as Ben said, she was, a, she was an answer to a modern editor's prayers. She'd been to Vassar, she wrote beautifully, she had great experience at Toledo Blade. She was a superstar from the minute she got to Post. But within about six months of her arrival, um, she had decided after finding some tantalizing leads but not being able to substantiate them that she was going to fabricate a story. And so she fabricated a story about an eight-year-old heroin addict, and it ran on the front page of the paper in September of 1980. Um, it made it all the way through the editing process. It made it through her direct editor. It made it through Woodward. It made it through Bradley, right onto the front page. <clears throat> Immediately, Mayor Barry, <laughs> paragon of credibility that he would, um, called it into question. He said, we don't think this person exists. I've asked around. There's no way this person exists. We've found them already. The schools would have known. Um, and a lot of people in the community doubted the story. But then uh, everybody went into their, what they called their Watergate book, which was back the reporter against all governmental inquiry. We're right. We're going to stand by our story. And they did. And they got away with it. April of the following year rolls around, the Pulitzer Committee convenes, and she wins. And she wins not even in the category that she had been nominated for. They jumped her to another category just to have her win. And so she won for feature writing, even though she'd been submitted for local news. And so within about, so there's a big celebration at the Post. They run this huge picture of her on the front of the Metro section, and she's a beautiful woman. Uh, and it was this really celebratory thing. And then about a day later, Ben's phone rang, and the phone of Howard Simonson, which is number two, his managing editor, it rang. And there were two separate people on the line calling to question her credentials. She said she graduated from Vassar, but the Associated Press had called Vassar, and she'd only gone to Vassar for a year. And so within roughly 30 hours or so, she had admitted to the host. It took some doing. She didn't admit it at first. She sent people out to find the boy, then said he moved, then said a variety of things. It became, the hoax became revealed in very short order. And so what happened next, I think, tells you, I guess, or tells me, told me, and the reason it has such prominence in the book, is that Ben made a decision, he made one decision, uh, and it was probably the decision that, more than any decision, Watergate saved his career and saved the Washington Post. And the decision was, in the wake of this hoax, the Washington Post would report every detail about the hoax before anybody else could. And they had an ombudsman, they were the, one of the first people to have an ombudsman. And Ben was not allowed to assign him stuff, but he kind of said, I'm not going to assign this to you, but how about you take a look into this. And this man named Bill Green, he wrote a 14,000 word summary of what had happened that had led to this hoax, which is one of the greatest works of four-day journalism you will ever come across, and I rely on it heavily in the book. Uh, but once that piece was published, there was never really another fact that emerged about how Janet Cook had fabricated her story. And that was what allowed the Post to survive. Um, and one of my very, very favorite letters of all the favorite letters um, comes after this moment. So the Post, not only did the Post have to do all this, but the Post then got sued, or a suit was brought against it by the National News Council. They said that there was no way Janet Cook, Cook could have fabricated it without the complicity, the complicity of her editors. They must have been pushing her. They must have wanted her to do this. Stuff that wasn't true. Um, and then, in the wake of, uh, after about two months of that suit, the suit was dismissed. And the people who had filed the suit and all of the sort of journalistic judges who reviewed it said that the report that Bill Green had done was conclusive, that the Post had done everything it could, et cetera. But there was a kid at Yale who went to school with Ben Santino. <laughs> and he, has, he had this really, really waspy name, so I called him to see if he would let me use his letter. Uh, and he said he didn't remember writing it, so I couldn't use his name, but I could use the letter. So the letter's here, but I can't tell you what his name is. Um, but he really wrote Ben this smarmy letter. Uh, and he said that he just didn't believe, so Ben had been at Yale for a talk, and he had, when they had asked him who holds a newspaper response, they said our readers. And so this guy writes, other members of your audience remain uneasy with that answer because it is not believable. The American people will not soon forget the Pulitzer hoax at the Washington Post. They will remember it as an early chapter in what may someday be called media game. Just as important, I hope you will remember this lesson and think of it longer before answering the next time someone asks you who keeps the press honest. So this is Ben's response. Dear whatever your name is. My God, you've gotten pompous at an early age. <laughs> your paraphrased question 
asks, how often do we see the media admit to inaccurate reporting? In the Janet Cook case, you saw the Washington Post admit to inaccurate reporting. You saw the Washington Post do it before anyone else. You saw the Washington Post do it on the front page. You saw the Washington Post apologize in an editorial. You saw the Washington Post unasked return the Pulitzer Prize. There quite literally was no other step I could have taken in the Department of Auto Criticism. Unique in the annals of American journalism, really. I am speechless at your injunction that I should remember this lesson and think of it longer. Before you settle down as a stockbroker or whatever, <laughs> and join the racket club or whatever, try to think for yourself if I may give you a piece of advice. So, <clears throat> That's bad, right? So colorful, but direct, to the point. Uh, and in a lot of ways, completely open. I, I'm going to open it up for questions here in a moment, but I'd just like to say a few things about Ben that maybe the substance of things don't get at. Uh, the way this book began, it was supposed I mean, I, I think people were probably right to expect it to have been kind of a puff piece. It's like, he's this legend, and you know, who am I? Uh, and it was so clear that my adoration for him was so real and that I think, uh, how could there be a book that would, that would pose any tough questions when I loved him so much? Um, and I guess what I'd like to say is just even after four years and after the book has come out, there's kind of been this little storm about it in Washington, and Woodward's pissed, and Sally Quinn is pissed, and all of this. Um, my, ad my admiration and adoration for Ben are unchanged. Um, and I think that's a really remarkable thing to say about somebody who you've written a book about kind of been through the ringer for and about. Um, but he's just, he's a remarkable person, and I think, I tried to touch on some of the history, but if I, the reason to read the book, the reason I wrote it, was because I just enjoyed spending time with him so much. And I, I didn't spend that much physical time with him. I mean, we did, but the majority of the time I spent with him was in these documents, in these raw things. And the raw documents themselves make up a lot of the book, and so what's fun about the book is you get to spend 450 pages with him, Bradley. It's like he's the best company there is. Um, so I want to read you another letter or two, and then I'll take some questions. Um, there are sort of two things that you, you can take as philosophy, either high or low. So I want to give you high, and then not necessarily low, but Ben. So here's the high. And I took this to heart um, when I was going through what I was going through the last couple of weeks. Um, Richard, I very much appreciated your note in the wake of the New York Mag excerpt, Richard said I'd really, I had clearly pissed off the establishment and therefore must have done something right. Uh, but Ben gave this speech in, in April of 1974, which is before Nixon has resigned, but it's right around when all the President's Ben's gonna come out. Uh, so the Post has been vindicated, they've won the Pulitzer, all of that is already done. But I think what he said is vital to who he is and is vital to the practice of journalism if it's going to stay vital. Uh, there are many obstacles on the road between philosophy and practice. There is rarely such a thing as absolute truth. We can only print what we think is the truth at the time, what we are told is the truth at the time. We are writing in the words of Philip L. Graham, only the first rough draft of history. More than any other profession, we are legitimately subject to the second guess. Unique among manufactured products, the newspaper is completely different every 24 hours, and it can't be recalled for mistakes of fact or judgment. It's produced in an adversary environment where the goals of the reported inherently conflict with the goals of the reporter and the reader. It is this daily conflict that gives concrete importance and meaning to the First Amendment, to freedom of the press. Without that freedom, there is no conflict. And without that conflict, there is no truth. And then this is my favorite Ben letter of all. This is, he wrote this after he was retired, and I actually I don't know who he wrote it to, and he doesn't remember. Uh, but if you want Ben's philosophy in a nutshell, and then I'll take some questions, it is this. Dear Ed, don't second guess yourself and don't look back. I'm quite sure I'd have made the same decision you did. It looked like a bright star, so it wasn't. Big deal. Fuck up. Best, Ben. <laughs> Thank you all very much. longer than I was supposed to, but I just kind of got going. Anybody have any questions?
Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, so you said in the beginning that um, you called up one of the, you know, the, the to, to get permission. To yeah, write, yeah, the daughter, sure. Right, to use the letter. Um, and you said, well, this letter starts my book, right. so can I use it? So right. is that really the order in which, like, you, you put everything in place and then you went out and tried to get permission? I should not have done it that way, <laughs> but that is, in fact, the way I did it. I was incredibly naive. Um, and there were some letters that I had to cut a few. Um, and there were a few that we, we the public, the permission department decided I could get away with it, which I didn't know. But yeah, I put everything together, and then there were a few key pieces that got pulled. But for the most part, people were cool. They were surprisingly cool. Uh, but yes, if I ever do anything like this again, the permissions process will work a little bit differently. I wonder if um, you ever heard from Bad Bunny. I don't think to be 
to say that. And so I don't expect it. It would be great if you did, but my sense is it would just then beg further crap from other people. Um, so I think the fact that uh, he hasn't said anything is, for the time being, is, is okay. I'm okay with that. But he's in a tough spot. Do you not think that his reference to the residual fear in his soul uh, could be some kind of uh, acceptance of the increasing revelations coming out of other books about Woodward, particularly with his background, the old intelligence, uh, Ben's own background, the right. intelligence, you know, and the whole, right. and the whole penumbra of intelligence involving uh, right. uh, 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 Mr. Graham, right. uh, and many, many people as opposed to the right. uh, Navy Secretary who Ignatius, yeah. Yeah. So, so what's so sorry? So the fact is, the question is, don't do you not wonder if there's not more there? I mean, I appreciate that he's a charming guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On his good side, but sure. Wasn't there another story there that perhaps was told back? I mean, I don't, I don't know that I see that as the story. I mean, I definitely, I mean, I, I had a CIA file, I had his FBI file. Um, there have been allegations that he had affiliations with the CIA. Um, he has always said no. The CIA files gave really no evidence that he had been. That doesn't mean they weren't sanitized before they were given out. Um, but I don't personally believe that. Um, knowing Ben, I don't personally believe that any of that came from naval intelligence. I think what that residual fear was really about was I put the whole paper on the line for these guys. And that all worked out OK. We won the Pulitzer Prize. We did. But there has since, in the wake of all that, become this sort of accreted Hollywood eyes, fetish, fetish eyes, fetish eyes, myth. And I think, what, I think where his residual fear is, is that some part of that myth, some founding piece of that myth, whether it's the flower pots on the garage or the garage meetings, whatever it is, that some piece of that myth was gonna turn out to not be true. I really think that's what it was. I don't think it was about some sort of deeper, more sinister intelligence network. I think he was basically just trying to say, this thing, this thing in the retelling has gotten a little bit out of hand, and I'm nervous that someone will expose some of the flaws in that, and then that paper down on the post in a negative way. I really think that's what he was talking about. Maybe. Hey, Joe. <coughs> uh, so when you're writing about a, a subject who's had so much already written about right. him and by him, at what point in the process do you sort of separate yourself from the previous books? I imagine early on you're like, well, I'm not gonna write this kind of book because it's already been written. I'm going to do a new kind of book because I have this new content. <coughs> but at what point do you just stop looking at the old book and not worry if you're hitting turf that's already been hit? Sure. Uh, that what I struggled with that. I mean, that was really, really hard for me. Uh, Ben's written a 500 page memoir for starters. So, I mean, you just start there. It's like, geez, okay. So everything is kind of bouncing off of that. And you know what I mean? It, everything is refracting through all these different things. Uh, David Remnick, who's on the editor of the New Yorker, wrote a great profile of Ben in 1995 for the magazine in which he basically knocked it out of the park. Um, and so there was there were a lot of precedents where I thought this game has kind of already been played and I struggled for a while with how am I going to do this. There was a period. So what I had that nobody else had was the, was the stuff, had documents. And so Ben writing his own memoir wasn't going to say, look at this hilarious letter I wrote in 1982, because he couldn't, right? I mean, he loves himself, and he, it's a very confident memoir that he wrote. But, but it's not, I'm not just, he's not shy or retiring about his own skills. But there was a lot of stuff that he couldn't do that I could do, just purely by nature of where I stood. Um, but at a certain point, I, I had thoughts of maybe I should just do this as like kind of a pastiche of the raw documents, and just let the raw documents tell the story and completely stay out of the way. Um, and I thought about that partially out of a sort of anxiety of influence, if you will. Um, but that wasn't really ever going to work. And there was a certain point, and for me, I can pinpoint it is boring, but in the Pentagon Papers chapter, which is the first real historical chapter in the book, when I figured out how to write that chapter, I figured out how to write the book. Uh, and it was a moment where I was able to blend kind of myself in the book, but not hopefully too much in the book, and kind of bringing my perspective to things, but letting Ben speak. And once I kind of figured out a way to frame the letters in a way that you could really hear Ben's voice, but I could also be in there kind of curating the tour, that was kind of the way I conceived of the mission, and then that sent me out. And then over the course of doing that writing, the reporting task changed. And so then all of a sudden I was chasing down this grand jury stuff and this Watergate stuff. And then that sort of wrote itself. Uh, but there was an initial moment where I had to decide my perspective matters. Uh, and that was not a necessarily easy thing to come by. Um, I know you addressed this a little bit in the Daily Beast piece, but uh, 
in all the criticism, is there any, has any of it been here that you, that what you're saying isn't true, or no. just that you're saying what you're saying? Just that I'm saying what I'm saying. Okay. There's been, there has, so when the New York Magazine piece came out, Bob and Carl wrote a letter uh, to the magazine, essentially, uh, in which they say that 95% of what I wrote in the book is true, just stipulated to that. And then where they quibbled with me was whether it was a big deal or not. That was that was the quibble. Um, and we had a 40-minute interview on the telephone, which I tape recorded via Craigson's request, which I could play for you, which is like staggering at how sort of unable they were to actually question anything they had said. Um, and in the New York Times piece, what, well, the reason that I objected to it um, is that they basically let Bob just kind of savage me, and they gave me no chance. Both they asked for no specifics from him. So he said his reporting is in it is, is dishonest, it's a distortion. Well, what's a dis what's dishonest? What's a distortion? Never asked that question, nor did they give me any chance to respond. So um, I knew the fix was in on that piece early, and it was. Um, and there wasn't much I could do about it. But nobody has challenged the reporting, not one person. Yes, John. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Bradley's relationship with JFK? It seemed to be a little oh, sure. pretty complicated. You know, that's one of the... I mean, all this other stuff in the book is getting so much, like, heat, like, I, so, um, you know, ben, Ben's son, who I've been in contact with a little bit, he's read the book, um, and that was, the Kennedy parts were some of the most interesting things. Um, and I, and, like, so, my basic feeling on them was that their relationship was a lot more complicated than Ben has ever let on. Ben wrote this book in 1975 called Conversations with Kennedy, um, and in it, it's all kind of like diary entries of interactions he had with the president and their wife, and his wife, and their wives. And it's very, very specific. I mean, it's like who had to get up and pee at dinner with <laughs> Joe Alsop. I mean, it's incredibly <laughs> granular. Um, and, and sometimes not that interesting, but it's, it, I, when I read that book, I read a very um, passive-aggressive tinge. And I wasn't the only person who read it. I mean, Taylor Branch is a great writer and still obviously prolific today. Wrote this incredible review in Harper's where he basically took a piece of heart and basically said the book is nothing like what Ben thinks it is. And I came to the same conclusion. And part of it for me was understanding two things. One is in 1975, Ben wrote that book and Jackie Kennedy never spoke to him because she thought it reflected on her and on Jan P. While Ben thought it was this great tribute, right? And so that's part one. Part two is he writes that book in 1975 without ever mentioning that Jan P. was screwing his sister in which he knew. And so he says in the prologue, I never wrote anything, I, you know, I've, I've never hidden anything about JFK, but then he writes this book and hides that fact. Um, and what I discovered, which I didn't know at the time, and I have since discovered other people knew, but I didn't know, was that Kennedy had gone after his wife too. And so a part of what I always read into their relationship was a kind of rivalry. They're these two golden boys, and they live four blocks from each other, they're both kind of, I mean, Kennedy wasn't a wasp, he was Catholic. He was of the aristocracy, and so was Ben. And in some ways, he resented Ben's <coughs> clubbiness. Um, but I read into it kind of two hard-nosed, incredibly ambitious people. And in this interview, which I go into in the book, shortly after uh, Kennedy declared his candidacy, there are these moments where you can hear the two of them whistling. And Kennedy essentially says, well, Ben, you're just a journalist. You know, Your field of inquiry is this big. Whereas I'm running for president of my school. And you can kind of hear the teeth grinding through the mm -hmm. audio tape. Um, and, and so for me, that relationship is a lot more complicated than it's ever been on. And Ben's not the kind of person who would say I was jealous of somebody else or I was angry about something. Like that. He would never cop to that. Um, but I definitely see that. And I, there are two chapters about Kennedy in the book. The first is sort of more celebratory relationship, and then the second kind of goes into some of these more fraud. Do you think that Catherine Graham was in love with Ben Bradley? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Yes and no. How's that? Um, do I think, it depends on like, how you want to say love. Do, I think they loved each other for sure. I think, and many, many people who are around the post will tell you that they suspected that she felt more for him than just sort of a platonic ideal of love. Um, the, the truth is I don't really know. It's like you go back and everybody says, oh, of course she was in love with them. And you read the letters and you read the exchanges and you see them kind of, there's this banter, but it's always kind of slightly loaded. Um, and I, my, and some of this was in the book and my ever-loving editor, Andy Ward, who's sitting here in the audience, um, he cut a bunch of stuff 
out that was sort of more speculative. Um, and one of the things that um, one of the things that I talked about and that I do think is true, but that I can't necessarily prove, which is why you don't put it in your book, um, is that I think actually Ben actively had to kind of manage against that affection from her. I think that was actually a big component of how he operated post. Like I think he was afraid that she would fall in love with him. I think he was aware of his effect on her. And I think for him, a big piece of it was how do you keep her right here without pushing her away and without letting her get too close. And in many ways, I think striking that balance for him, and this is the part that Andy cut, striking that balance for him was one of the greatest balancing acts of his career. And I can't prove that. But I think that's true. I think he had to really play her perfectly. And I think it's to his great credit that though they had moments of intense strain, he never lost her. Uh, he was always able to keep her close enough that she was always in his, in his corner. But in terms of like love, love, I just, I don't know. I mean, my suspicion would be yes, but I, I don't know. Uh, I'm curious about your, your reaction or your feeling about when Woodward was confronted with Ben's death. Right. Or, did you anticipate his reaction? And after it's, it's the sort of run its course, do you think it's just ego on his part? Or do you think it's, uh, he's, he's really feeling that there, there isn't anything? That there is or is not anything? That, that there isn't, as they wrote in their book. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I think the reaction belies that claim. You don't go crazy over nothing. Um, but I think, as the moment unfolded in real time, so I go to Bob's house, I interview him for 45 minutes about Watergate. I finally, that was the moment where I had every date and every story down. So we really, like, we talked through him. That moment ends, I slide the pages over to Bob and he reads them. I knew they would have an effect. Just, I didn't know what the effect would be but I knew there would be an effect. So he reads them for six minutes, seven minutes, and when he looked up at me, I could tell that it had had a profound effect. And it was a very, very precarious moment for me because in that, well, Bob, is the, Bob is the essence of information is power. And the way that he presents his information is power, and that's how he functions as a journalist. And he's explicit about that. I'm not imputing that to him. He'll tell you that himself. And in that one moment, all of a sudden, that, that gradient had flipped. Um, and I could tell that that made him very uncomfortable and made me uncomfortable. Uh, but over the course of that interview, he kind of cycled through a series of answers, and all of which I relay in the book, which come closer and closer to how he probably wished he responded right when I passed them to him. But by the time we got to the end of the interview, he was there. So when I got home, I thought, you know, that shook him up some, but he, he got back on track, you know, he figured it out. And I figured this would be literally, and I'm not exaggerating when I read the book, I figured this would be like a moment in the book, and I would say Ben had these doubts, and Bob was kind of knocked back for a second, but totally got it, and it's not a big deal. Um, and then three days later, I'm sitting across the table from him, and Ben is there, uh, and it's basically the Billboard work press. And so in that moment, and I, Ben and I talked about this at length, and it was really around that moment where Ben really said, you can't protect me, you can't protect anyone, you have to follow your nose. But in that moment, I thought, whether I stumbled upon it, whether I created it, there is something here. And I knew the grand jury piece at that point as well. And so I thought that the reaction, while an overreaction, was also indicative of a real phenomenon. And I worried initially that people wouldn't believe, people might not believe my account, like, you know, I'm lowly Jack, and he's illustrious Bob. And then the New York Magazine excerpt came out, and he did it all again for everybody to see, which was mystifying to me, uh, truly mystifying to me, because if you didn't want to call attention to something, typically not do what he had done. Um, and to me, I think, I mean, my honest, my honest feeling is maybe there is something there that isn't quite straight, and I think that's why you're seeing the reaction. You're seeing Carl very smartly just kind of disappear. Uh, <laughs> he was like, see ya. Uh, very smartly, I think. I mean, that's the right response probably. Yeah. It's like they have this myth to maintain, and, and Bob is much more jealous of that reputation than Carl is. Carl has had a much more difficult road since we So Carl is much more open to being seen as kind of a flawed hero. Um, but Bob has a different relationship with sort of perpetuity than Carl does and has a different sort of vested interest in maintaining its reputation. So for me, I think when you put his reaction to Ben's doubt alongside the revelation of the grand juror, I think that does tell you something meaningful. And I don't think it's just this is nothing and this is a betrayal by Jeff to put this in a book. I, I think that is complete smoke and mirrors. 
I think I have uncovered this much, and I think there's probably other stuff that could be uncovered, uh, but I could only take it as far as what my evidence suggested. So that's, that's as far as I took it, but the reaction to me speaks volumes. Yes? Uh, how much how much do you think that this, this reaction was the fact that you had this long relationship with him? And do you think that he would have reacted the same thing? Just a third party is writing about I agree. I don't, I, I can only speculate, you know what I mean? I mean, it, it's impossible to extract myself from the situation. I think, I know from other people who contacted me in the wake of the book coming out, I've heard from a lot of people who've kind of been uh, naysayers about some of this stuff, and they've said this is exactly how I responded when I did this or when I did that. Um, I think what is hurtful is that I was someone who was inside the tent. Um, and not only was I someone who was inside the tent, but, you know, I had been inside his tent. And for me, there was a real distinction between what happened when he was 29 years old in 1972 and what has happened in the years since. So when I worked for him, we wrote a book called Meister. Every single fact in that book was checked, verified. I mean, there was, you know, everything. I'm not imputing anything to him. All I, all I can do is say, this is what I found and it doesn't match up. I think he probably, because of the relationship, expected something different. Um, and I think there was some genuine surprise that not only was I going to report it, but I was going to really report it. Um, he had fair warning, but as he showed, that kind of didn't matter. Um, so yes, I think it's I think it's psychologically complicated for everybody. I mean, at that table, you have my former boss, his former boss, and now the person I'm writing about. It's a very complicated time. Um, and a lot of people have read this edible stuff into it, which is above my pay grade. I don't, I'm, I'm not trained in that. Um, but people have imputed that stuff, and that's fine. I think probably, I think probably Bob would have behaved a little bit differently had he not thought that he could just tell me what to do. And I think he probably thought he could tell me what to do because of the experience that he had. So I don't think he would have reacted differently now to somebody reporting the same thing. I think he might have behaved a little differently in the moment because I think he probably thought Jeff doesn't have the balls to do some of this stuff. He was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question, then we got to close it off. Thank you all so much for coming. Sure. So how much is the controversy boosted the uh, Amazon rankings? You know, um, I, I don't really know. I don't think as much as anybody expects, I hate to tell you. Uh, I, I think a lot of people just assume because they see your book being mentioned in places that you're like selling through the roof. So like I did a radio interview last week with Dan Ruby, he was a national CBS guy, and he was like, he was like, so, you know, with the skyrocketing sales, and I was like, dude, I don't really know about skyrocketing sales. <laughs> like, there have been a lot of people talking about it, which is a good thing. Uh, but not all the talk has been good, uh, not for me anyway, not for the book. It's not really been reflecting what the book is about, or about Ben, or who Ben is, or any of that. And so I think there's been a little bit of a sort of dissonance there that I'm hopeful that time will remedy somewhat. Uh, but as far as like rocketing to the top of the list, it's like, hadn't happened yet. So we're hoping for late groundswells of incredible readership. <laughs>